Well, our speaker tonight is Matt Marash. He works at Midwest Photo. He's an educator. Um, he says, being a photographer in the era of smartphones and social media can be exhausting. Digital photography continues to improve and technically good photographs become more effortless to take. Bodies of photographic work get pushed further down an endless feed. Turn my video off. Those that aren't constantly putting out content fade out the collective consciousness in an instant. My name is Matt Marash and I'm a photographer that works at an intentionally slower pace. I work with an old wooden camera and big pieces of eight by 10 film. I use the demanding process of large format photography to carefully evaluate every detail in the scene and steadily construct each photograph. So he's an educator at Midwest Photo and a regular contributor to the Film Photography Podcast. And I'm sure Matt will tell you more about himself. So turning it over to you, Matt. OK, thanks, Roberta. And thanks, everybody, for having me today. Is my mic coming through? Everything coming through? OK, cool. Sweet. Yeah, I can't, now that I'm talking, I can't hear you guys. OK, well. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is this is a lot of fun. I kind of feel like I'm on a book tour right now because I've what I'm going to talk about tonight is something I've been talking about uh, for the last few months nonstop. And uh, but before we get to that, and just a little back uh, a little background. So I've been eat sleeping and breathing photography for the last uh, 12 years now. Uh, last 10 of them, a whole decade, I've been on the Film Photography Podcast, which is this crazy show hosted by these guys in Jersey talking about all things film photography. I've been doing film photography for the last 10 years, but I've been photography a little bit longer. And yeah, it's, it, I did it initially because it was something different and novel from my digital camera. I actually remember kind of shooting film when I was younger, but not too much. I'm kind of in that transitional period. So I started with an early DSLR. It was kind of, mm, and I wanted to differentiate myself. And I picked up an old Hasselblad and then pretty soon this old eight by 10 and all of a sudden years and years have gone by. and. I'm here at Midwest Photo now, have been for quite a few years. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of familiar names here in the feed. So it's really cool to see all you guys. In fact, I think I saw a few of you today here at the shop. Um, and if you're wondering why I have the mask on, it's because I am at the shop. Uh, I'm doing a Zoom broadcasted class tomorrow. So I have to, we, we're on the up and up here at the shop. So got everything set up here. What I'm going to talk about today is the act of taking, uh, taking the gear you probably already have and using it in a way that can kind of help you archive, uh, archive your memories, which is uh, kind of a neat thing. And the setup that I'm using to do that, I always like to talk a little bit about the tech because I'm a techie guy and you know, I'm at the toy store. So we've got all the toys, we might as well use them. And one of the toys I'm using to broadcast this stuff to you guys today is I'm just using a, a basic camcorder. So the camcorder I'm using is just like a little Canon deal like 300 bucks and it already has a pretty nice look to it, a pretty nice feed, but you can see this mess of wires in front of me. This is kind of looking like uh, everybody's old aunt's Christmas tree, right? You know, there's just a million cables running in and out. And this is so I can show you exactly what I'm doing uh, from my uh, from my DSLR and mirrorless setup, which is kind of neat. So this is this little box right here. Ooh, it's getting kind of warm. This is my ATEM Mini Pro, A-T-E-M Mini Pro. This is a device from Blackmagic Design. What it allows you to do is you can have four things running in through an HDMI input, and then you can push those out. Uh, I'm actually looking at all of this on a big old screen, and it kind of is like uh, the Brady Bunch vision that we have going on in Zoom, where I have multiple views but I can effortlessly press little buttons and you should see things switching. So you'll see my screen, you can see my camera, and then you can see back to me. So it's just a really nice way to share things that are going on. And the cool thing is it runs right into your computer as a plug and play USB webcam. So if you can use a webcam, this is a MacBook from 2012 and it can still power all of this really cool stuff as well as in, uh, not just encode the stream, record it, all of that fun stuff. So this is actually all stuff that I've stolen from our rentals department. So I can talk about this stuff tonight. All my stuff is at home, uh, but it's easier this way. I know how all this stuff works. So uh, I'm running this so you can see exactly what I'm seeing as I demonstrate how to take your DSLR or mirrorless camera and digitize maybe some of your old film, whether it's film, prints, negatives, slides, 
uh, we can really do the whole thing. And the reason this method is it's just kind of becoming more popular is a lot of the scanning technology that's out there. So like your flatbed scanners and, and the like, a lot of that technology is based on stuff that's 30, 40 years old. And in terms of tech, you know, can we think, can we think back 30, 40 years on what our computers did? Not too much. They were a bit of a headache. And if you try to use some of that scanning technology today, it'll still work. And a lot of it will still give you really good image quality. The only problem is you're going to be uh, phasing out technology wise. So less and less companies are supporting that. You have to trick it with adapters and firmware and stuff. And the truth is in the convenience sense, we already have tools which are excellent at getting us a really good reliable image and we can send it to our computers uh, just lightning fast. So I'm gonna demonstrate some things about the setup and uh, oh, I guess I, I missed some background stuff. Well, anyway, uh, if you like the stuff I'm talking about today, there's other places where you can, or you can check out my work. It's just my last name.com, which is M-A-R-R-A-S-H.com. I can actually pull the whole thing up here. It's mirage.com. And you'll, you'll know it's me because you'll see a website that'll look something, something like this. You'll see a video in the background. So that's me out in Hawking Hills taking pictures of freaking trees, et cetera, et cetera. So I do all sorts of stuff, shooting local, love taking pictures. So all this stuff is done with eight by 10, yada, yada. So tech stuff aside, that's the kind of work that I like to make and like to shoot. Um, anyway, I wanna focus on getting this, getting this DSLR scanning setup rolling. So um, I'm guessing just based on who I see in the chat, and um, make man, oh, hey Donna, make that the whole screen. Oh yeah, can I make myself the whole screen? I don't know if I can. Um, I can go speaker view, I'm not sure. Oh, no, the individual can do that by changing the view. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so, when you're trying to, uh, if you have some stuff at home, old negatives, old slides, old prints, we do have not just the technological limitation of aging hardware and trying to convert things and make it work. Uh, we, have the, uh, we have the time factor. And that's usually the thing that, that really bums people out is how long it's gonna take to get that stuff digitized. I myself own a flatbed scanner and for some things, it's still the most convenient tool I have but for the things I get asked to do a lot, especially for my family, I'm using DSLR and mirrorless scanning now. Now I don't have this awesome camera. This is another one from my imaging department. But even the little mirrorless camera that I do all my stuff with, all my YouTube channel stuff and my quick digital work, I shoot with a little Fuji X-Pro3, which is 26 megapixels, plenty to do all of the scanning stuff we're gonna talk about tonight. So if you have a camera that's digital, made within the last five years, has I'd say 18 to 20 megapixels of resolution, you already have a great tool that you can use in the same way that I'm gonna to show tonight for DSLR or mirrorless scanning. But the camera is not gonna be the only thing you need. I do have some other tools set up here and I'm gonna break those guys down and give you some live examples of what it's gonna look like when you take these tools uh, use them together to digitize and make some pretty cool prints. So, you know, why are we going to want to to take this stuff and uh, and bring it into the 21st century? The most obvious reason is to share those memories. Um, there is nothing like looking at an old slide, holding it up to a light source, and if you still have an old slide projector, just running through those, running through the carousel. We all probably know what the carousel noise sounds like, and uh, if we had that uncle that took way too many photos, we fear that noise. Otherwise, it kind of brings back that that lovely nostalgia. And for me, going through an old shoebox full of Polaroid prints or just even four by sixes, you know, it has a different meaning than if I come across like a, an SD card or a hard drive. If I come across an old hard drive, I go, ah, oh, crap, now I gotta do something with it. Or even like an old floppy disk. When I see a slide though, or a print, it takes on a whole different meaning. We can visualize that memory, it takes us back instantly. That's one of the beautiful things about photography. So that's why we'd wanna digitize this stuff. So I've got my DSLR, my DSLR slash mirrorless camera here. It doesn't matter which type you have. 
The mirrorless cameras do make some of the factors that we're gonna talk about and show today easier, but not required. Um, you'll see some of these cables, I've got some of them, I've got uh, one cable or two cables running from. That's just so I can show you guys what the camera is seeing. You don't even have to have this. So the first thing about this setup, it is not rigid, it is not fixed. Um, you have to have something to kind of hold it up and make it rigid, but you can move this setup. This is a really big thing for our growing imaging department. We have a bunch of scanners and big old printers, but those take up so, so, so much space that's and a lot of them scanner wise you can't move them you have to like go through all this hokey pokey stuff to lock down the scanner and make sure it doesn't get dirty or banged around it pretty much always stays in one location with this this is already a camera you use and if you set it up right with a quick release or have something like a copy stand here you can uh, set up do your thing pack it back up and bring it back out when you need it so this is uh the setup that I'm kind of moving to from here on out. And um, hopefully, speed-wise, you'll see why I'm into it now. So let's break it down. I've got a camera. We really need four things to make this happen. I've got my mirrorless camera. The specific camera we're using today is the Sony a7R 4 because, well, why not? <laughs> Resolution-wise, it's about as good as we can get on a full-frame camera without uh, going absurdly high cost. It's still not a cheap camera, but it's... Uh, 61 megapixel full frame camera. This will scan handily any film I throw at it, 35 millimeter. Uh, I have a super slide here tonight, which is a, a 127 little square format uh, uh, negative and slide. I also have some medium format, some 645 and 6x6, six six, so 6x6 six six centimeter um, film. So we'll be able to digitize that quickly and bring it right into our editing software and get it, uh, get it cleaned up and ready to go. And I'm also gonna show a few tips and tricks on how to do that. Now, the computer I'm using today is not my own, so I don't have Photoshop and Lightroom on this one. I do have Capture One, uh, but I'll show you how to do it anywhere where you have levels slash curves control. I'll show you how to do it there. So we've got our camera. Four things. First thing is our camera. Second thing, we're going to need a lens that's going to let us get relatively close. Preferably a macro lens, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a macro lens. If you have a lens that has the little flower on it, so a close-up mode, so if you have maybe like a Tamron or Sigma all-in-one lens that allows you to focus like one or two feet away, you could still use one of those, but then you would have to have a taller support, our third thing. I am using a macro lens because again, I just pulled this from our imaging department. This is the exact combination we use in our imaging department. So we use a Sony a7R 4 and this 90 millimeter macro lens. This 90 millimeter is a true macro lens. And what that means is I can achieve a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but in terms of macro, that's really, really, really super close. That means I can reproduce an object the same size on the sensor of the camera. Let me show you. I'm gonna jump over to my camera view. So uh, this is my Sony in live view, and you know it's in live view because I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wave my hand in front of it and you can kind of see all my fingers there. I'm going to take, I've got a little slide here and I'm gonna throw that up on the camera. And this is a really cool little 127 Noda color. I don't know, maybe that's like a fake of Coda color, I'm not sure. But uh, I have this old color slide. It's got, some, uh, it's got some classic fading because it isn't a Kodachrome slide, it's fading to blue. Usually you lose color in red, green, in Roy G. Biv order. So red, orange, yellow are the first things to fade in prints. Now, because I am this close, I am at the minimum focus distance of this lens. If I start focusing this lens, you can see just how close we are. This camera has focusing assist. Look at that. I can focus the exact grains of silver that are going on uh, with this. So I know that thing is in focus. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy. That's why we use a macro lens for this sort of thing. If you don't have a macro lens, but you have something like a, somewhere between like a 50 and an 85 millimeter prime lens, so a fixed focal length lens, you can also utilize a extension tube kit. So extension tubes are hollow metal tubes with the electronic contacts that you can place between the camera body and the lens. They'll turn your lens into a dedicated macro lens, but it'll throw away a lot of the autofocus features. It'll still try to autofocus, but it won't do so well. Because we're using this fixed setup, it's not gonna matter too much. So uh, kind of reviewing, we've got our camera body, 
piece one. Piece two, we need a lens that can give us some close-up focus, either because it's a dedicated macro lens, it has close-up capabilities like an all-in-one zoom, or because we're using a, uh, an extension tube set. So we've got camera body, a lens that can go close up, and then we're gonna need a support. This is actually an old Nikon copy stand that we fished out of a dumpster. Not even kidding. We, we found this thing at, uh, I think we were picking up some stuff from a school and they were throwing it out. And this is a perfect condition copy stand. This is the Repro Copy PF-4. Um, I know this, uh, we looked it up, this copy stand's older than I am. And it's, uh, it's great. It's got a powered gear drive. So all I have to do to change my, my lift on it, there's a little bar, I can push that and I can move the whole thing in and out. Uh, what's really nice too is this has just a, a little twisty arm and I can twist this off in the back and that's going to take my camera right on and off, which is really nice. If you don't have a copy stand, you can use a tripod that has like a center column on there. That will work pretty well. Um, but whatever you end up with, you'll still have to make sure you're able to level your camera and stand or camera and tripod combo. So the mirrorless cameras are nice for that because they're gonna give us a digital level to, to do all that stuff. All right, I threw, of course I threw my focus out of whack just by doing that. That's not too bad. Cool. So we've got our camera, we've got our lens that can go close up. We have our support, which can be like a copy stand, a tripod, heck, you could probably even, uh, if you wanted to keep it even more DIY, just uh, put a two by four into the side of a bench and then put a quarter inch 20 screw through there uh, or a quick release adapter and then just use that so it's at a fixed distance all the time. Uh, fixed distance isn't as convenient as having a movable column, but you can keep this, this is about as, um, there's so much scale to this. So we could, you know, we could do this setup with a phone if we wanted to, but we can also keep it, uh, keep it really high end as well. There's other companies that will make professional copy type stands for this, but uh, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm tired of buying all these new products and Kickstarter things. I'll work with what I've got when I've got it. So the dumpster stand, we cleaned it up, sanitize it, and it's good to go. So the last thing and probably the most important thing that we're gonna need for this type setup is a light source. I'm using a fixed LED light source. This is a Reflecta LED table. There's so many of them out there. Um, the one that we use uh, for our darkroom here at Midwest Photo is actually this really big one that we got from, I think Monoprice is who we got that one from. And I had to search around and say, you know, like, is there one that is one I recommend? This Reflecta one's pretty good. There's so many like it though. Um, I found the most inexpensive one that has a nice even light source, and that's actually this guy. This is the Godox LED M150. This is a compact battery powered LED light. It runs via a USB type C, so it has a rechargeable lithium ion battery. It is large enough to handle, oh, I thought I unboxed this one already, all right. It is large enough to handle upwards of medium format film. It has a diffuser on there already and it gets super duper bright. So this is actually brighter than our other LED light box and it is plenty for the big, uh, the big film whenever I need to. Um, but just to showcase how important the light source is, I'm gonna cut to my camera and it should just look like, well, darkness. The light source is pretty much everything when it comes to uh, to this digitizing setup. So I'm gonna turn it on and you'll see it flickering for a second there until it gets up to full power. So this is another thing that can happen um, with more inexpensive light sources. The more inexpensive your light source is, um, the less even that light's going to be and the more flickering you might end up with. Because all light sources that we use for convenience sake, like LEDs and fluorescent lights, because all of those actually flicker on and off at, at very fast pulses or hertz, um, we need to make sure that we're counteracting that. The easiest way to do that, I'm gonna jump back over to my camera because I wanna talk about settings on the camera. One of the first settings to think about, this is just locked up in manual exposure. Uh, manual exposure is nice because I can, I can change my f-stop like that, I can change my shutter speed, and I can change my ISO. Now preferably, you want to get that ISO really nice and low, that's going to keep your image quality high, but doing so 
and keeping an f-stop that's going to be a, giving me a decent depth of field, I'll need to lower my shutter speed. Lowering your shutter speed is actually okay with this type of setup. It's, it's not bad at all. Because watch what happens if I raise my ISO and I raise my shutter speed. So I'm going to raise my ISO up to something too high. And I'm going to raise my shutter speed. If I raise my shutter speed too high, I'm actually not seeing much of it right now. Let's see if I can get to the point where it shows the flickering. Oh, it's not too bad. Darn it, I got a good light source. All right, I'll lower it to a... <laughs> Do we see that banding, that flickering that's going on now? That flickering is because when these lights are at a lower power level, they pulse on and off. And you can probably even see it from, uh, from this angle. I'll go back to the... That's not something we want. By the way, if you ever watch a YouTube video and somebody's light is doing that in the background, because they're an amateur and they don't know the manual settings on their camera and they haven't appropriately set the shutter speed. Anyway, I'll stop ranting about that. So back to our camera. Turn my power back up and we'll get our settings to where we need to be. Because we're effectively not moving the camera, we're going to be on the camera stand or a tripod, we can again lower our ISO down to its lowest. That's going to give us our best image quality and then we're going to set our shutter speed to something that's going to make our image look good and we're going to need our depth of field. Now depth of field wise, we don't have to, we don't have to shoot wide open. In fact, with a macro lens at this close distance, depth of field is going to be a liability. I recommend somewhere between five, six and eight. Now there is such a thing as too much depth of field. Um, one thing that can happen with a light source like this is if you do enough of this film or copying on a stand like this, you can end up with scratches on your light source and those scratches will show up through there. Um, this guy has been used for years and at this point I just have a very very thin plastic uh, plastic coated sheet and that's giving me some extra diffusion. You can use parchment paper if you like. Um, if you want to go really fancy there's this uh, there's this stuff that you can buy from a scientific supplier called opal glass which is professional diffusion glass. They use it for scattering uh, bright bright light sources and lasers. Um, I use a piece of that uh, for my scanning because I already have it. I bought it for other nerdy photo stuff. But uh, opal glass is another way to go. And the glass does not scratch near as quickly as uh, like, a, like a plastic or a Lexan or acrylic. Uh, those scratch super duper easy. So uh, that's, that's one consideration. Good light source and then you're going to have to have good diffusion. Um, I had a customer who didn't want to throw down for a very expensive light box, uh, but they already had a bunch of flashes. And I said, great, you can just use your speed light flash. It, it might take some jerry rigging and to diffuse it. All they did is those little $10 diffusers that pop over the flash, the little ones that like come with it for free. Those are fine because they, they give enough space between the light. The more space you give it, the more light you'll need, but the better diffused it's going to be. So um, you can really go as DIY or as high end as you want with this stuff. There are professional scanning uh, and light sources that are out there, but they can get, I mean, this is, I got into this because I wanted to do this with the equipment I had without buying more specialty stuff. So um, that's what I usually assume when people are, are looking for this type of thing. You can spend thousands on getting professional light sources, but it's, this is going to be fine for most, uh, most uses. Okay. So to recap, camera, lens that goes close up, preferably macro, something to hold the camera, preferably a copy stand, but you can do it with uh, with a tripod as long as it can look directly down or has one of those columns that goes out and then down and then a light source. If you've got those four things, you can do film at home, which is, I mean, that's the, that's the whole deal. So here's how quickly we can get that, that going. I spent more time explaining it. It actually is very quick uh, to copy over there. So we're going to move to the camera. We get our settings. You know what? Let's frame the whole thing. Let's get a whole square. So I'm going to pull my copy stand up. Check my focus. Gosh, I love the focus check on these mirrorless cameras. Cool. Get that. Got the whole thing. Now remember, this is a 61 megapixel frame. I'm going to go ahead and hit my, hit my shutter. I've got her set to two seconds uh, on the countdown because I don't have my cable release on me. Two seconds. Now, if I had a tethered setup, I could just have that running out my USB into the computer. But again, I didn't have my tethered stuff at home. I'm going to pop in my memory card over to my computer. And if we do a whole series of these, this is very, very easily done. All right, capture one. I'm going to share my screen. 
Capture One already sees what I'm bringing in. I'll import that. You can see Magic of Television. I already have one right here. I'm going to go to this one. Look at how much detail. I am seeing those are the individual little grains and bits of deterioration that have happened over the years. This thing is plenty sharp. And from there, I'm ready to I'm ready to edit. I can I can grab my crop. So I can crop it in. That's going to be good. Cool. So I've got my crop. Let's go to our loop. All right, so I'm cropped. Let's get our uh, let's get our image adjusted a little bit. So I'm going to move over to my levels and my curves, which is uh, this lower left hand section here. So these are just my outputs. Um, so this is my histogram. The histogram is the record of the recording of shadows to highlights. So this over here represents jet black. Over here is bleach white. And you can see this little curve of information sits kind of within that range. If I pull this toward the end of that, the bottom of that curve, it, the image snaps. It gets a little bit darker. And I can do the same thing with my white output. Push that right here. And just by doing nothing, then pulling those over to the little peaks and valleys, I already have a cleaner, more contrasty image. And if you're a little bit friendlier with curves, you can also start applying a curve to it. So I can pull my shadows down. Uh, it's maybe a little bit too much. Pull them right here and make an S. Whenever we make an S, that makes it look a little bit more like film. Nice little gentle S like that is going to do pretty well. So I already like that. Maybe add just a bit more contrast. I'll take my... Let's see. Now I just want to play around with my color. And I can take, I'm going to warm this, warm this up a little bit. There we go. And that's, I mean, that's a little bit magenta. Let's pull that one back. So, so my tint adjusts my magenta and my green balance. All right, I'm going to jump to my Magic of Television one. I already had one auto adjusted, and this is already looking pretty sweet. I'm going to get my Crop square, go in here, crop this guy. Come on, get the crop. Uh-oh, hopefully we didn't crash. Everybody still see me? Everybody still hear me? My screen didn't move too much. Okay, I think everybody is still there. Great, all right. So, oh, we're, okay, we're good. Um, so that's just working from a color image. Color images are really easy to work with. A lot of folks are nervous about doing things like black and white. Black and white is just as easy. So I'm gonna pull my card out, pop her back in. Again, if you have a camera that tethers, you can just use the USB cable to push it directly in. So I'm doing it the hard way, I guess. It's not too bad. And I'm just shooting JPEGs. That was a 61 megapixel JPEG. And by the time I was cropped down, that's still a 30 megapixel picture. So that's taking a little super slide and turning it into a 30 by 30 print. Easy. All right, I've got a strip of black and white negatives. I think these were from a, a black and white workshop we did forever ago. Oh my gosh, yeah, these were from two years ago already. Back when we'd never had to wear masks. All right, pull these guys out. If these aren't your negatives, do it with gloves so you don't get human oil on it. I'm gonna move to my camera view and you can see, uh, now I've got a 35 millimeter negative going on here. And when you're scanning film, whether it's negatives or positives, because we're dealing with film, we have two sides of the film to worry about. We have the shiny side, which is the film base side. So you see that big reflection the film is giving us there? That's the film base. When we scan our film or we digitize our film, we want to get the film emulsion, the dull side closer to the imaging. So you see how this isn't as shiny on this side? It's got a little bit of shine, but nowhere near as much as the shiny side. So this is the dull side or our, our emulsion side. Now, because it's a 35 millimeter negative and I'm working with a macro lens, I'm gonna go ahead and bring it in closer. So I'm bring my stand down and, oh, brought it down a little too far. There we go. Look at how crazy 
close we're getting. Those are the individual grains of silver. That is what's so cool about working with our mirrorless camera. I'm just moving my framing by hand. It's much easier to move the film than it is to move the whole camera setup. I'm gonna focus again, make sure we're sharp. Every time you move the camera, you're gonna to have to check your focus. All right, so I'll keep, I'll keep my film borders. Some folks like sprockets on there. So again, I'm just gonna two, one, capture. I'm just gonna push it over. Don't pull the card out so the light goes off. Push that over. I'm gonna run her into capture one. And you don't have to be using Capture One. You can be using Affinity, um, any, really any software that can process a raw file, you will be good to go uh, to use that. So I'm gonna jump over here, import this one. Hey out there, everybody. Everybody can see the grid, the grid within the grid. There we go. Okay, so we have our black and white negative, which is pretty cool. I'm gonna check, my, check with my loops, see if everything's looking good. Look at how crazy crisp that is. So 35 millimeter film is what I'm doing right now overkill? Absolutely. Nobody needs to see a 35 millimeter frame at 60 megapixels, but we have that capability. So that's why I said, if you have a camera that is 18 or 20 megapixels, that will still be faster and more convenient than using your dedicated film scanner. By the way, to get this high resolution with a, with a flatbed scanner, you would be waiting about 15 minutes for the scanner to do its thing and it would still have to be plugged in the whole time and God forbid you get up and walk around, you set a cup of coffee down too, uh, too hard and you shake the thing and then you gotta restart. Or, you know, even we, we, before we started the meeting, there was, uh, you know, folks had pets jumping around, whatever. As soon as any of that shakes the table, you have to start over when it comes to scanning negatives. So there's pros and cons to each system. I think, though, the pros here outweigh the cons. You know, I'm talking to a camera club. Y'all probably have some cameras and probably have some cameras that can do a really good job with this or know somebody that has that lens you can borrow so you can do a really good job with this. Um, what I like about this is this method has actually made scanning kind of fun again. Like I'm not, I'm not going, uh, more stuff to scan. Now I'm kind of excited because I know I can move through a roll of film very quickly. The one uh, potential downside to this is, you know, if you have 700 slides to scan, yeah, that's going to be a bit more of a slog than if you only have one or two to do. So there's always, there's always ups and downs to it, but I think the, the pros here are gonna outweigh the cons. So I'm gonna jump back over to Capture One. I'm also gonna move this little light out of the way. So what do we do when we have a black and white negative like this? Now we have some, have some interesting stuff to work with. I'm gonna go back to these curves and this is where, uh, this is where things get, uh, get a little bit interesting. Because I want to do uh, black and white and not color, I can even just leave it as my color histogram for a little bit. Oh man, do I remember how to do black and white conversion here? <laughs> do my RGB. I think I can go to adjustments, color mode, ah, don't worry about it. So when I have my Oh, I guess I could just do a JPEG. Anyway, um, all we have to do is reverse our levels. So remember how I took the black point and moved it in before? I can still do that right now, but that's not gonna do near as much as what I'm about to do. You have to invert these points. So if I pull my black point up to my white point, uh-oh, my picture just went away. Don't worry, it's gonna come back. I'm gonna take my white point and pull it down. Hey, look at that. Pretty cool. If I pull it back here, it's gonna pop my contrast a little bit too. And if I pull this one over here, it's gonna increase my contrast. I've already got, I've already got a pretty good, pretty good handle on this exposure. And this is a wild thing. Because we just re reversed our levels, white is black and black is white. If I increase my exposure, it decreases the exposure here. And if I de decrease contrast, it increases contrast. It's, it's all, so brightness makes it darker, brightness down makes it lighter. So that part takes a, a bit of getting used to, but it's not too bad. And let me see if I can, <laughs> oh, 
and go to black and white. Enable black and white. There we go. Now we have a really nice uh, black and white positive. Sure, a scanner is still gonna make it a little bit easier than working uh, the way we had, but let me show you where we started and where we ended. And I couldn't do it with a before and after in the software, but I also still have it on the light table. So we started, we loaded it onto the light table. There it still is. We shot a picture, we could tether it right over. You can also set these things up in Capture One or your Lightroom or Photoshop. You can set up a preset. And when it's tethered, it will automatically import and do all of the things that we just did. So we went from here to here. And the quality we have is insane. So even with my cropping all the way in, I still have slightly over a 50 megapixel finished picture that Again, I would never need to print a, like a 30 by 40 of, uh, of this picture, but I have all the information there. And a lot of the time, as long as you have a, about a 20 megapixel resolution camera, you should be able to get really good quality scans to get upwards of an eight by 10. And for those really special, really sharp slides, you can get sometimes even 16 by 20 out of it, which is I think all we really kind of want out of these. The biggest size we're, we're usually printing from older 35 millimeter negatives and slides uh, is about eight by 10, eight by 12. For those really, really special ones, yeah, we'll blow them up a little bit more, but before we would have to do scanning that would take hours and hours to really uh, detail and refine. Here, now that we're using our DSLR and mirrorless scanning, the workflow is more solid and there's less handling of the film throughout. And I know that sounds like a very small thing, but the more times you have to touch something and fiddle around with it, especially when it's somebody's memories or your own memories, you just don't want to do that. You want to be as gentle as possible with the film. This doesn't mechanically force it into a scanner or flatten it or anything. It's just uh, laid right on the table. The worst that we'll do with film that is curly and won't sit flat, we have a specialty piece of frosted glass. It's called anti-Newton glass or ANR glass. Uh, we purchased ours from a website called betterscanning.com. I think the piece of glass was like 50 bucks. It's a little four by five piece of glass. Uh, you can also go to the hardware store and get some grinding paste and a, uh, a piece of glass yourself and grind something out. And you can make one for about three bucks if the hardware store, uh, store will cut it for you. So again, there's DIY and really, um, really expensive ways and DIY ways to do things. But what, the reason I wanted to talk about this tonight is because again, your camera club, you all already have cameras and I'm sure most of them are more than capable for this DSLR and mirrorless type scanning. So you can put it to use in a different way. And you know, this is that time of year. If you're scrambling for presents and you've got a whole, whole shoe box full of old slides and prints, digitize them. It is so much fun to create a little slideshow or create a series of prints and start going through those. I know what I'm doing this year, especially because I've got this set up down. I've got a whole bunch of old Polaroids that I think my mom and dad have forgotten. I'm gonna scan those through, make a couple nice big prints. We just got in this new metallic paper. I'm gonna make prints from that. And those well thought out gifts, they're well thought out and they're memories. You're just giving somebody access to those. I'm sure we are all looking forward to thinking about not 2020 here at the end of 2020 uh, and doing that with your memories is a good way to, uh, to approach it. Um, I guess, you know, that's kind of my, my, my short and sweet of it, but does anybody have any questions about this type setup? I know there's a lot of like little tech things I went through and I want to make sure um, I, I address those because there's, you know, there's definitely more to it. Can you do the same, uh, it's Roberta, can you oh, hey. do the same with a color slide or a color film? Oh, so the, um, you mean the little inversion I was, I was doing with the color? or with yeah. the black and white? Yes, you can do that with color, um, color negative as well. There's an extra bit to it if you're doing color negative. So color, did I bring any color negative? I didn't bring any color negative. So a color negative is very similar to a black and white negative in that you have, uh, it's a negative, but color negative is a little bit different because it has this orange masking layer. And that orange masking layer is there to set the white balance. So color negative film has a daylight balance most of the time. So it has that orange to counteract it because the opposite of that's gonna be your daylight blue. So there's an extra little trick that needs to be done to it. 
Um, and what you have to do is you have to use a, a white point in your editing software. Um, you can set your white point from that. So once you invert it, everything will have a blue cast. You'll go to something that you know is white or clear in the scene. You set your white point from there and that will eliminate out the rest of that. From there, there is some fine tuning because color is never 100% correct unless, unless the family photographer was putting on all the right correction filters and such. Uh, so there is that little extra step to it, but it is possible to do this with color negative. Uh, if this is something that you, you, you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all of my old negatives with it, um, there are presets. Um, there's a preset pack out there for Photoshop, Lightroom, and Capture One. It's called Negative Lab Pro. I can't remember what the, the cost is for it, but you're paying for a plugin and it already has in it presets for different films. So if you are a big film shooter still, or you have a bunch of stuff, um, that's a really good way to, uh, to get the best quality um, out of that. And there's just, the presets are already built in. So what you're paying for is the convenience of somebody else kind of programming in uh, that preset. But that, that's a really good question, Roberta. Thanks for asking it. Sure. Hey, Matt, I don't know if you can see the questions there, but um, Frank Begun had one um, and he said many of our slides are in, is it Jeppy? I don't know how to say it. Oh yeah, Jeppy, yeah. Do uh, you see so, that? Yes, I do see that. So you can shoot through the glass, but there's a consideration to that. And it's actually a consideration that I had to make tonight here in the learning studio. So when you're, sh um, it's not impossible to shoot, oh here I'll, move back to my camera. It's not impossible to shoot through the shiny side. So you definitely can shoot through this side, but I'm going to go ahead and do, uh, do one thing. I'm gonna move over to my, uh, to my overhead lights and I'm gonna turn my light on. So I have a row of lights. So do we see that little bit of glare right there? There's a bunch of overhead glare that I'm getting because of the film base, or in this case, the glass mount. When I turn off that overhead light, that glare goes away instantly. So if you do have it in glass mounts, uh, you're gonna have to remove that reflectance. And one easy way to do that, if you don't wanna turn off lights and you have it on a tripod, you can just, put, uh, you can just clamp an umbrella over top I know it seems silly. It's not like it's going to rain, but uh, the umbrella will get rid of a lot of that. Uh... Oh, does everybody hear the train? <laughs> oh yeah, there's the train. You can tell them at Midwest now. Uh, anyway, uh, you can put an umbrella on top and that'll remove some of that extra uh, reflected light from getting on there. Um, and actually uh, in the comments, Mark, uh, Mark Full had pointed out that uh, this is the right side of the film, and you can see that by reading Canon on the young lady's camera. Um, so all, the other thing I'd have to do is I'd have to uh, go into my software and invert. So I can do that with a control I a lot of the time that, that flips it, or you can go to uh, rotate and uh, rotate horizontally or rotate uh, vert vertically, and that will, uh, or, or flip horizontally or flip vertically, that will uh, invert your, uh, your rotation on there as well. So. Um, there are a lot of ways to kind of work around this. And again, they're all, they're all according to taste and uh, what you have time to kind of set up. So in the comments here, Charles, thanks for looking that up. Yeah, Negative Lab Pro, it's not the cheapest thing, but there are some pretty good presets in there. Um, I haven't thrown down for it because I actually shoot a, probably like 90% black and white and, uh, and maybe it's probably even less than 10% color for a lot of my film stuff that I shoot. So I haven't thrown down for it, but if you do a lot of color negative, it, it really is worth, uh, worth getting something dedicated like that. Um, now I did mention that there's some things that I still use a flatbed scanner for, and there's some things that I use this technique for. And I would say it really depends on the size of your film. So I have shown 35 and 127 or super slides. Um, let's see, probably the biggest I would recommend with this technique would be like a, ooh, what are those? Those are more 127s. Um, the biggest I would recommend with this technique is probably four by five. Anything larger than a four by five, and you're gonna be, you're really gonna be kind of pushing the resolution, um, resolution to convenience of, uh, of your medium. Oh, that's kind of a boring negative. That's all right, I'll put that on there. So also pull this back for, so, oh, that's a nice sharp house. 
But how big is this thing really? It's really big. This is a four by five negative. Whoops, there we go. This thing's a monster. So that's a four by five negative. There's my 35 millimeter right next to it. So that's a lot of meat. That's a lot of real estate in a negative. Um, you're kind of doing a disservice to this format, this size negative, shooting it with only, only 60 megapixels. Um, there is a way around that, of course. We could, we could stitch. So what I could do is zoom in a little bit more, come in closer. Got my, oh my gosh, look at that detail. It's insane. All right, anyway, so I've got that. I could actually go to one corner, left corner, take a shot move it, take a shot, and eventually, after about 20 or 30 pictures, I could then bring these into Photoshop and make a giant stitched uh, final, final picture. This is actually a technique that we use here at Midwest Photo, not for 4x5, uh, but we use it for funky films. So does everybody remember disc film <laughs> from the old, uh, what were those? What are they called? Not the master view, was it? Where you just push the little button and your disc uh, your disc film moved around. Disc film is a lot of fun, but I would say as somebody that works uh, in imaging some of the time, it is my most hated format of all time because <laughs> they're very, very, very teeny tiny little positives and scanning them cannot be too much fun. And if we have to do that now, we, we use these guys to stitch it together and then let Photoshop, uh, Photoshop's AI handle the, uh, handle the magic and try to get some of the sharpness back out of that format. So I would say upwards of four by five negatives, uh, you can do a great job scanning with a DSLR or mirrorless camera. And one thing that makes this even easier, because I'm using a mirrorless camera that has some video functionality, if you're using a camera that has live view enabled, now I can use this HDMI cable to push it to a big TV. So I, I don't trust, I'm not wearing, uh, I'm not wearing corrective lenses right now, but I don't trust my eyes. I haven't since I was 20. I use a camera where I can use a, a loop on my ground glass because that's all I can trust. To do all of my focusing, I was never looking here. I was always looking uh, right behind me on the camera here. There is a giant 50 inch screen. That's what I'm using to do all this stuff. And it just works really, really nice when you can push it out to a bigger screen. Um, so that's what I would recommend for this. Oh, here we go. Um, I've got more questions. Thanks for having questions, guys. Uh, so from John, uh, oh, so my light source is, this is the Godox LED M150. And this guy right now is on sale. It's $49.99. It has an internal lithium ion battery. It charges via a micro USB and it is bright. I mean, it is so bright. If I hold it next to my light source, it is, <laughs> It's about two and a half stops brighter than my standard light source. So um, maybe too bright for the settings I currently have. Um, and this battery at full charge is going to last, it's gonna last me about an hour and a half. So that means I don't have to have it at full power. I can have it at a lighter power and still not get that kind of flickering that's going on because it has plenty of it. Um, Godox makes a really good LED and they also make some really good flashes too. So uh, thanks for that question. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see, Matt, can you send an, ex uh, can you sample an unexposed section of the orange masking layer on the color negative to use a re reference for setting white balance? Yes, you can, Charles. So, um, the unexposed area of your, uh, of your masking layer or the orange portion of your color negative. So it's, it's kind of dealer's choice. You can sample it. Um, before you invert, but I recommend sampling it after you invert. So you'll set your white and black points, kind of pull those in the opposite direction. So that now that you've inverted them, that has to be your white point. So you set that little area as your white point for your white balance, and that should snap you back into place. There is also a really good uh, video. I actually just watched it a couple days ago because I was doing this technique. There's a really good video by by photographer Alex Burke. So that's B-U-R-K-E. It's about a four minute video showing you how to manually invert color negative film in like the cleanest way possible. It involves adding an, an extra layer mask um, and accounting for the blue. It's using a multiply um, layer. 
a little bit trickier than doing the whole white point, but it's a little more accurate as well. Uh, if you don't know Alex Burke, he is an amazing, amazing uh, large format landscape shooter. Uh, he makes me want to do better color work, but I'm stuck here doing black and white. So that was a great question. Thank you very much for that. Um, does anybody else have any questions on this uh, on this technique? I know I know some of you out there are film shooters. Anybody? Where would you put your camera if it's on a tripod? Ah, good question. So down like that. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, if you have a tripod who ha that has a column that comes up and out, so uh, the tripod I'm actually filming with right now is a, is a Manfrotto that has the little red center column that comes up that allows me to push it out and over the tripod. Some tripods, especially if you have those mobile tripods that folds up like a music stand, so the stands go from here to like up here, a lot of those will have a center column that twists and comes out. That will allow you to actually put the column in upside down and then point the camera down. I use this little one from ProMaster. They just, uh, they're actually on sale right now at the store. They're called the ProMaster XCM tripods. Those ones actually have a column that you can buy. It's like an extra 20 bucks and it, it positions it anywhere between 90 and 90 and 30 degrees. And then the whole column just comes out and you can position it. One end is a weight hook. So I can usually put like a, uh, my other gear bag in there and that's going to hold everything up and I actually just kind of leave one like that because when I do my video stuff sometimes I have a top-down shot um, and other times I'll just put the camera on there to do uh, this type of work. By the way, I don't have a, a camera stand, a copy stand at home. It's just really nice and I still can't believe that somebody was just throwing this thing out. Well, I can. It's, it's really big and hefty and it kind of smelled when we first got it so I'm glad we cleaned it <laughs> off. Um, but that's... Um, that's going to be the best way to do it. So if you have a tripod that has that column that comes out or a reversible column, um, if you have one that just goes straight up and down, it, you're going to have a harder time unless you have the, the tripod with the legs spread out. So some of them will also have a, a little lock on the leg that will help the legs go out from 45 to like 90 or 120. Uh, so anything that helps you get lower to the ground level so the legs stay out of the way. Um, that would be another uh, way to position that with a tripod. So really, yeah, if you can find an old copy stand, go on, uh, go on Craig's, Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, see if somebody's getting rid of one. Um, my, my number one rule for something like a copy stand or an enlarger, don't pay for it. <laughs> for every one person uh, that wants to buy one, there's probably 10 people that are giving them away or you just gotta, just gotta wait for the right place or, or right time when it comes to those. So this is one of those things that I am not advocating going out and buying brand new gear. This is a way to utilize the gear you already have in maybe a way that you haven't tried. Uh, I certainly hadn't tried it, and there's been some younger folks that have been doing it for, uh, for years before I even tried it. It's a way to, um, it's a way to, to uh, copy your, um, your, your negatives and make them digital, digitize them. <laughs> sure is mirrorless cameras. Uh, so Charles had another question. Is the color temperature of the light source important or is it corrected with the white balance? Good question. So because I have my camera in, uh, in manual mode, another thing that I want to fix, um, especially if you're working with color negative or color positive, you, um, you want to shoot in a fixed white balance mode. And I, I say this because we just want to, we want to make, make it very even and consistent from picture to picture. Um, I'm actually shooting these in JPEG because I'm not using my home laptop and it doesn't have the most up-to-date version. So when I shot a RAW file on my Sony, uh, the camera was like, hey, what's this? Um, so that didn't do me very good. So I ended up doing JPEG. And because I'm doing JPEG, I have to have my white balance. Now, what I prefer to shoot is RAW. And when you shoot raw, then you have more full control over that white balance after the fact. So there's no penalty for choosing the right or wrong white balance. I mean, put it up the day after. This is the Westbridge meeting. Kathy, can you please mute yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. Uh, so when you have um, when you have raw set on your camera, it's not going to matter too much. But I still recommend setting it manually on the camera because even if you get it wrong. 
Now setting your white balance is just as easy as copying and pasting from picture to picture. So the other thing that makes this, I think a little bit more convenient is the fact that you can kind of automate this. So all those steps that I just did in Capture One or in Lightroom or in Adobe Camera Raw or Affinity or Luminar, all of these will have presets and those presets allow me to copy those settings so I can establish my base settings. So probably the, the longest time you'll be doing this is for the first picture. And then beyond that, if you're doing uh, more pictures of a certain type, then you can copy those settings and paste them all the way through. The whole thing is about getting in and getting out with this, keeping the setup relatively light. Um, and another way to do that is to kind of group like pictures. So I don't mean like theming, you know, you don't have to do all the Disneyland pictures in one day, but do all of the types of pictures at the same time. So if you have a mixture of color and black and white, do all the color positives first. So do all of those and then move to the, uh, to the black and white negatives and then move to the bigger stuff. And then if you can sort them by size and this will just keep things a little bit more, a little bit more streamlined. So if you're doing 35, you're doing 35 all day. Um, at its fastest and it's optimized kind of settings. So we have this set up usually over, <laughs> over on the other side of the store where all the toys are. We'll have all this set up and we'll have it tethered and running into a new version of Capture One, which uh, is Capture One 20, but in a few weeks it's Capture One 21. They go by the year. And that one um, tethered from this guy our guy, Andy, if you don't know Andy, he's our imaging wizard uh, when it comes to restoring and, and precise color. He's the man for all that stuff. He is able to do roughly three to 400 slides per day doing this. And that's not just the scanning, that is scanning, cropping, color correcting, and exporting. So the full start to finish. And that is crazy high numbers compared to what we had before. Because before we had a scanner where we had to load each and every one of the trays and you have to load it the right way and then nothing can move and there can't be any errors happening on the computer. So there's so many more things that can go wrong when you have to like leave it and go away. So the one downside is yeah, he's, he's sitting there and pushing them through. But then as they're coming through and while he's uh, you know, while he's waiting on, on the next one to come through, he can just set that parameter and apply those settings all the way through. So for black and white, we already have a preset in there. And now we can do our rolls of black and white. Usually we process black and white film on Friday and usually scans are ready by Saturday afternoon now. So this is just a means to make things a little bit faster. And when they're faster and when you can see the results right away, pushing it right over to the computer, you're getting that instant feedback and chances are you're going to like doing it if you can do it quickly. Um, oh, hey, we've got more, uh, we've got some more questions. Um, oh yeah, Affinity is, Affinity is pretty awesome. I think it's, it's like 79 bucks and it's already like, it's already 99% of what photographers are gonna use uh, for Photoshop. Luminar is a pretty good Lightroom alternative. I, I need to wean myself off of Adobe. I still am kind of like addicted to Lightroom and Photoshop because it's what I grew up on, but I really want to move away from it. For all of my video stuff that I do, this year, 2020, I've done far more video than I've done stills photography. And for the video stuff, I use, um, I use DaVinci Resolve. And really, it doesn't matter what I use because I'm not paying Adobe $30 a month. My bank account was hating me. Now I can have three extra, you know, Netflix and Hulu type subscriptions for the same price. And I'm way more entertained uh, than opening up Adobe Premiere and like getting anxiety and closing it again. So um, as much as I don't have to pay Adobe, uh, I will try to do. Um, oh, 40, 49 right now. All right. So yeah, Affinity, go for it. That's, that's a sweet, sweet price uh, for all of that. Um, all right. So Rob has a question too. Do you have a recommendation for naming the digital file and being able to cross-reference it with the original slide? That is a really, really neat question. Um, the only convention I can usually think of if it's something that isn't labeled is I will look for something on the film rebate or who I got the film from. So a great example of that, I was given, I was given three rolls of kind of mystery film from, uh, from my parents. And it was actually, actually ended up being some of my grandfather's rolls of film from World War II when he was uh, stationed in Italy. They were really kind of odd pictures because they're all these landmarks that I'd known of, but nobody was there. Everybody had fled town. Uh, it was just like a, a few, uh, a few like um, 
Allies soldiers just kind of occupying the place. And then there was a few pictures where I'm like, hey, that's grandpa, but that's not grandma. Anyway, that's a whole different thing. Um, the, the only way I could name those was just what I saw, uh, what I saw on, on one of the labels of film. And I would just go, you know, I'd start my naming um, mystery role, uh, mystery role one and then zero of uh, however many were on there. Or a lot of your scanning and digitizing software you can create a session. So if you're doing uh, Lightroom or Capture One, um, I think even Adobe Camera Raw using Bridge, so you can use that uh, for free, you can create a new session. And during that session, you can give it a naming convention. Uh, this is one of those places where my familiarity with Lightroom makes it a little bit easier. I'll just start, um, I'll just create a new, um, a new tethered session. So I'll start my tethered capture, I'll create a new session. And in that session, I'll just name it uh, black and white 35 and I'll usually just have it read the metadata uh, for the date and just have it plug that in. So uh, the naming convention that everybody has their own, but one thing I recommend is write down what that naming convention is so you don't change it halfway through. I would always agree on, oh, this year I'm gonna name everything like this. And then a few weeks into the year, I'd go back to an old way and it would suck and then I wouldn't be able to find anything. So. Uh, when I'm scanning my film, so the stuff that I'll do with like my 8x10 view camera, I'll usually, when I create a folder for that, um, I'll create the folder based on the day I scanned it. So not the day I shot it. So the day I scanned it, what the content of the film is, and then usually um, my file name will be the name of the film and then shot number, whether it's in order of how I scanned it or how I shot it, whichever one I can remember. <laughs> That's usually how I'll name it. Um, one other thing, I always, I feel like a broken record because I'm always talking about this, but another reason for digitizing all of this stuff is the fact that you want to have a backup copy of stuff. There's an old adage from the IT field and it's called three, two, one. If you have something that's important to you, you want to have three copies in two places. One of them should be offsite. Let me give you an example. So, uh, 2020 has been a wild year, but my worst year hasn't been 2020. It was actually 2019 uh, because in early February, 2019, somebody remember when we had that, uh, that really, really cold weather where it got into the negative degrees. I lived in a third story apartment and one of our pipes burst and it was the, it was the emergency sprinkler line for the apartment. Our third floor apartment flooded with frozen water and I had some, I lost a couple of negatives, not too many. The, the thousands were, were fine, but there was a few that were ruined. But the digital stuff I had, toast. But because I'm already somebody that practices a little bit of what I preach, my negatives were fine. And I also had some files in the cloud and I also had an offsite backup. So I'm really big about backing up your files. And those files should be off-site because of things like floods and fires. We never like to think about those things happening, but we know things happen, right? So having a copy that isn't in your physical house, whether it's in an outbuilding, um, another easy one is if you have a safe deposit box. I'm a millennial, so there's no money in mine, but I have some hard drives in there. Um, another thing you can do is keep a hard drive at a relative's house. I have another little hard drive I have at my parents' house. So I've got something to do. Oh, hold on a sec, mom, let me go start my backup. I'll go do that and that's just another routine. And every few months I'll back that thing back up. But now I'm also, because of the whole flood thing I had, I also have a little backup server at home. You can create a little home uh, backup system using what's called a NAS or Network Attached Storage. Uh, if you have more questions about those, you can always feel free to shoot me an email. Um, it's matt, M-A-T, at M-P-E-X dot com. I'll actually put that in the chat here too. Da, 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 da. Send to everyone. My email is matt at mpex dot com. Yeah, feel free to shoot me an email if you ever have any questions. Um, I got my, all my stuff from my NAS. I built one myself because I'm a total geek, but if you ever need help with that, um, you can go to Micro Center. We have this awesome Micro Center location. It's one of the original ones right over on Bethel Road. Strongly recommend it. They're awesome folks for that. So the whole reason for doing this stuff, it's the reason we do photography, right? It's for those memories. 
This is just another way to bring those memories into a new century, put them in a format where they're shareable. So if you've got old negatives or old prints or you've been bestowed the family collection because you're the photographer now, that's what you do. This is a great way to digitize those and be able to share them either with a, a newer generation, put them online so you have that backup copy online or just so you can make more prints and share those memories again. That's the whole point. That's the whole reason we do this stuff. Um, and the more, the more I do this, the more I value those prints because there's nothing like looking at a print. I look at a print I made a decade ago and I go, wow, I used to be good at this. <laughs> or I'll just look at it and go, wow, I think I'm a little better now. You know, like they, they give you a feeling you're back in there. So that's one of the beautiful things uh, about documenting this stuff, bringing it into a new century and making a print. That's, that's the whole goal. Um, speaking of prints, I always have to do a little bit of uh, shameless self promo. Tomorrow afternoon, I'm hosting an, a digital class, so kind of the same format uh, from this same location on printing. So how to get those pictures you have ready for printing, how to figure out what, uh, what a good resolution for printing is, what isn't. You're already in the camera club. You probably already know quite a bit about printing, but if you want to learn a little bit more about it, uh, we've got that class going on tomorrow afternoon. If, uh, if you want to see uh, more of the kind of crazy stuff I do, or you're not sick of hearing my voice, uh, there's some other places you can check out the kind of stuff uh, that I do. I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to pull it up full screen uh, and you can see it here. So this is, um, I actually have a, <laughs> a YouTube channel. It was one of my lockdown projects. I got, uh, uh, I got bored, uh, silly me for getting bored. Uh, so I picked up another, uh, another part-time job just on top of all my others. And uh, this is my YouTube page. You can, just go, you can just go on YouTube and search Matt Marash. You should find me there very quickly. Otherwise, you can type the name of the series that I do, which is called Large Format Friday. So Large Format Friday, each and every Friday I have a, a video that talks about shooting this old timey format. So I shoot with my eight by 10 camera. And if you wanna learn how to do that or just kind of follow along with all the other crazy stuff that I do, um, that's, what the, uh, that's what the channel's about. And I also mentioned I do the Film Photography Podcast. Uh, now this is not my solo deal, I'm just the, uh, one of the co-hosts on it. Uh, but this is our site, filmphotographyproject.com. Uh, we've got crazy film stocks, uh, this one that just came out. Uh, and yeah, if you like doing the audio thing, the podcast thing, uh, that's, uh, we have, is it like 200 episodes? Yeah, we have, we're coming up on 300 episodes here pretty soon. Um, they're like a bad college radio show with fart noises and everything. Um, and yeah, kind of a fun, fun cast, lots of banter. It's not, it's definitely not too tech, not too serious, but kind of a fun, uh, just kind of a fun romp in, uh, in all things film photography. So that's where you can check out some more of the, uh, the stuff that I do for that. Um, yeah. Anybody else have any questions or um, has anybody tried this method with their, uh, with their DSLR or mirrorless camera? Oh, got another question from Charles. Um, do I advise using a film holder? If you already have a scanner that has a film holder, you can just go ahead and use those. But it's not, uh, it's not too big a deal. If I have uh, slides that are already mounted and they're, they're in the, the cardboard, that's already holding them flat. I have seen folks literally just take packing cardboard and cut out a mask and that was fine. If you have an old and larger that has those platters that hold the negatives, you can make one of those. You can use mat board, cardboard, um, you can buy the really fancy glass holders or you can use that ANR or anti-Newton ring glass. Um, so that's glass that is frosted on one side so you don't get some of that shininess and reflectance coming back and it won't throw off the camera either. So you can, but it's optional. So I'll, I'll almost never tell anybody what to buy. Even though I work at the toy store, I, I try not to tell anybody exactly what to buy because there's so many different ways to do it. This is not a fixed in kit. I mean, if you do want a kit that's kind of ready to go with the light source and everything. There's a brand called Negative Supply and they're kind of like, they're like the super high end. Uh, we sell them to like institutions or photographers that have like collections of stuff. So like uh, for the next person that discovers a, a Vivian Meyer or Vivian Meyer like photographer and just has tens of thousands of negatives to go through, something like the Negative Supply or Negative Supply Pro would be, um, would be a way to do it. But for that, that much money, you 
probably better off buying more other fun toys or a vacation to go, uh, to go shoot with that. So I recommend starting with the tools you have. Uh, so light source wise, you know, if you've got a really nice window and something to diffuse it with, that can get you started. But all of the rest of this is a, in a means to uh, kind of optimize that process and make it a little bit, uh, a little bit more stable. Um, yeah, so film holder, definitely optional. Cool, anybody else? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, you asked if anybody had done this. Uh, I've, I've done some at home. Um, I inherited from my mother a large family collection, archive boxes and boxes, including wow. glass negatives and so forth. And nice. so uh, uh, I've got a, a full setup that works pretty well. I converted an old Bessler 4x5 enlarger for, for, uh, for copy work of, of prints. Mm -hmm. And then I took a, I, I got on eBay a Honeywell Repinar that I converted over to use a flash for slides and negatives and stuff. So I'm, I'm more than willing if somebody's curious about this or wants to, to, uh, to have them come over and bring their camera and a card and, and try it at my house sometime. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. So this setup really can be, uh, that's perfect converting the enlarger because the enlarger already has a bunch of different things. It usually has a diffuser. It already has the column that you can raise things up on. So that is awesome. You're just repurposing something that, you know, maybe somebody was, uh, was throwing out or you, you had and you just haven't used in a long time. So that's the whole point. Kind of breathing some new life into gear. Um, a new rule I have, uh, I bought a, we got a house last year after the, the whole flood and everything. And I quickly realized if I'm not using something for about six months or so, I've got to get rid of it or got to move it along to somebody that will use it because otherwise I'm going to be a hoarder really, really quick on top of all the photographic geeky things I get into and all the stuff my family members end up getting for me or saying, Oh, you're the photographer here. Take this, take this. It's, it's too much. And I've got, well, Hopefully I've got a few more years ahead of me playing around with this photography stuff, so I gotta pare it down. This is another way to breathe new life into some old gear um, and just have a kind of a, a fixed setup and make it work. Ah, here we've got, uh, Donna has a question. Do you work with taking photos of artwork? I'm also an artist and need copies. I have them done professionally now. So this, this type of setup can be used for copying artwork. The downside with um, artwork is Artwork is not going to be backlit. You're not going to put light underneath it unless it's very specific artwork. Most artwork you're going to need to create a copy style setup where you're going to be using uh, fixed lighting and you're going to be positioning it at a, uh, a fixed angle. So you, um, there was a distinct lack of prints for this setup. You can photograph prints with a setup like this, but instead of having a light source underneath, you're going to have to have a light source. Uh, well, preferably two light sources off to the side. Uh, a lot of old copy stands will come with uh, little Edison style bulbs, so the thread end bulbs, and those will be positionable. Most of the time you're gonna wanna put the light at a 45 degree angle. So uh, let me turn my light on here. Actually, I've got a, do I have something? Yeah, I've got something that we can use as our, as our quote unquote prints. So I'm gonna move to camera, camera three, and pull this guy all the way up. Da -da -da -da. Let's see, can I focus? There we go. Ooh, there's my Godox. Great, so I'm gonna turn my light table off. So I've got my LED 150 right here. And if I wanna present this in the best light, I'm gonna to have to hit it with some light. And you can already see because I have a reflective surface, got my light right here. If I shine my light on this, and I'm at the wrong angle, right now I'm at about a 45 degree angle, if I start, moving my light and I catch it at the wrong side, I start to get this reflection coming in. If I pull it away, I'll still have it, but it won't be as intense, but now I can kind of see how orange it is from the natural light that's in here. And if I bring it in closer, can't bring her in too close because I'm get, gonna get some of that shininess in there. So I bring it in, say about right, right here. I've actually got it, I've set my light up. Eh, we're not quite 45, but we're at a bit of a different angle from where we were, and that's gonna help get rid of that glare. So at that point, you wanna have something where you can position the light. So old copy stands will have like flexible arms or, or at least little pivot points where you can move that on there. Um, and you're definitely gonna want more than one light because if you have just one light, let me see if I can find something with some texture. 
Here's my little ProMaster card reader. I've got something with texture and I put a light to just one side of it, I'm gonna get a strong shadow on the other side. So having a light of equal intensity is gonna help fill in those other shadows that are created on the opposite side and vice versa. If I put my light here, I'm dropping a shadow right here. So I'm gonna need uh, at least two lights to help get rid of that setup. But you can use this uh, for copying artwork. Um, the other downside of course is when you're doing single capture. So one picture at a time for that artwork, it's not gonna be very high resolution. So that's why the professional services, they will usually use a setup that has some type of scanning going on, either manually stitching it together um, through Photoshop or they're using a, um, a camera that has a stitching mode. So there's some of these new cameras that actually can shift the sensor and do what's called pixel shift and they'll shift it around and that'll stitch together a ginormous picture. Now, I also know a few of the members here uh, at Westbridge and this is where you can, uh, you can bug Dick Wood. Say, Dick, get the, uh, get the newest firmware for your GFX and let me use it to do some pixel shift because that, that, uh, that whopping GFX camera can now do pixel shift technology and create whopping 400 megapixel pictures, which is uh, more than enough, enough for just about anybody for anything. <laughs> um, yeah, so for artwork. Now, the other thing about artwork, um, the white balance is now going to be more critical. You're going to want to use a light source that has what's called high CRI or color rendering index. When you use a, harsh, a high CRI light, those are more color accurate. So you can really trust the color of the light. So not all LEDs, uh, $50 LED versus a $200 LED. What's the difference? The quality of the color of light. Now this one's not too bad because it's a fixed daylight LED. So if I'm shining this on myself and I set my white balance to daylight or 5,000 Kelvin or like 5,500 Kelvin, I can trust that I'm gonna be getting 5,500 Kelvin. But when you're using a copy stand set up for reproducing art, you wanna make sure your color is right on point. So that means controlling the amount of ambient light. So I have these overhead lights. If I was copying artwork, the first thing I would do is turn down these lights because turning those down, if I just shift over to my camera, you see how I'm getting all of that extra bleed coming in there from the overhead lights? There's only one way I'd be able to solve that and that's to cut the overhead lights. Cutting that out entirely is gonna be the only way that I can account for, um, for all of my color coming in. So um, two dimensional things like, uh, like artwork where we have to light it or add light into it can be a little bit trickier than, uh, than doing the like negatives and positives, but it's very much possible with this setup. Maybe a little bit more lighting and a little bit more patience. All right, what's Dick saying? I have uploaded the latest TFX. Oh, hey, hey, all right, there you go. 600 meg uh, megapixel, but what do you mean, but it's 1.8 gigs? It's got a, yeah, that's a, that's a big file. So uh, pro tip, Dick, for working with those files. Um, if you're saving this into Photoshop, you have to save it as a file format called a PSB or Photoshop Big. That way you won't make your computer catch on fire and take a crap every time you try to open it or play around with it. So yeah, PSB files are your friend. Those will handle up to, I think like four gigabytes a piece, uh, unless you jump into the, uh, the newest Creative Cloud version. So that will really help. All right, does anybody else have any questions? No, yes. Cool. Well, thanks so much for, you know, having me out to, uh, tonight. Uh, I really wish I could have shown some of this in person. It's, it's always nice to, uh, to kind of like see something in the flesh. But honestly, uh, with the way we've been setting up a lot of these virtual things, I think you guys at home are getting, getting maybe a better view than even if you could like come up over my shoulder and take a look at the camera. So uh, again, this little streaming deal that I'm working with, I don't want to move it too much. I don't want to completely disconnect. But this guy, this little flashing deal right here, this is the A10 Mini Pro. If you're doing a lot of stuff via Zoom and you want to be able to show a feed from one camera, maybe a second camera or your computer or a third camera, uh, up to four, that's, uh, that's what this little tool is. We even rent this thing out. So if you didn't want to drop the 600 bucks for this little encoding box, uh, we rent it out for 35 bucks a day. So if you've got a really special event and you wanted to live stream that thing, or you want to kind of live stream the big, uh, the big you know, uh, 
remote, remote family Christmas table or something that you have going on, uh, we rent this thing out. So actually everything here uh, is from our rentals department. So we've got that. You can always go to mpex.com slash rentals. Check that out. Um, all of my classes, I think, for the next little while are going to be remote. So if you do want to check out some of the other classes we have, those are online at mpex.com. So mpex.com forward slash learn. Those guys will be, uh, I think the first quarter of those are going to be up here pretty soon, the next few weeks. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Matt, so much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it was great being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good, as always, Matt. Thank you. Regardless of menopausal status. All right. Well, everybody, I think that's it for tonight. Thank you so much. Yep. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. See everybody in a couple weeks. Oh, I'm out of here, folks. We'll see some of you soon. All right. All right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.